<laughs> that makes a difference. Hi, Sue. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Okay. Wow, now you look spiffy, Dave. I feel better. <laughs> uh, did it uh, get below freezing last night? Uh, no, no, but tomorrow night. Okay, okay. Or, or tonight, actually, I should say. The, the forecast looked like for the next two or three nights, it might get down in and around below freezing. That's what, what we're seeing too, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Hi, Sylvia. Good morning. Morning. Good morning. Did it get cold in Iowa too? Uh huh. About freezing. <laughs> but it's um, sun is shining and harvest is good. And yeah. How you took? How are leaves doing up north? It's that one. What? Le leaves in Indiana. Okay. Iowa, that could be, I'm just, could They're really nice this week. Pretty. Leaves look, yeah. I think we've had some of the most color yeah. we've had in the last few years. In the middle. If they're not, I think I read all the Indiana one, but I was just. Hope they stuck around for another week. I'd like to see them. <laughs> Did you ever reply back? I'm getting ready to do that. They're not getting any rain or anything to knock them down. Mm -hmm. Although a lot blew down in the winds we had. Yeah. Park County, I hope the same thing because this is the bridge festival week. Oh, I see Nancy. See Norma. <laughs> I can't see Norma. I don't know what you're, you're in the narrow band at the top. <laughs> oh, it shows the whole room. Dave, are you still thinking you're coming next weekend? I am. All right. Yay. You, you uh, know what day you'll be there? Um, well, the current plan, which is debatable or negotiable, I guess, but would be to leave here on Thursday morning and get up there around Saturday afternoon. Uh -huh. Probably start back maybe on Monday or Tuesday. Yeah, I think we're going to stay till Tuesday morning. Okay. <clears throat> I don't know. I haven't checked the rental rates yet. They're um, really good. Are they? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> if they're not there down the street, they're good. <laughs> <laughs> you can still set up in the church parking lot, probably. Hmm. I'd probably stop either out, out at your house or at uh, Larry's, maybe. Well, come to our house. They're expecting you. Yeah. So they were eager to meet you. Are you going to be there? Where are you? Yeah. Staying? Yeah. I'll probably um, drive on Friday. Like, and be like there that. by supper time Friday. That guy you live with coming with you? He is. <laughs> I they maybe have the harvest done by then. I was wondering. Wow. At, at least um, I, I told them <clears throat> they'll probably be done by the time we get back. So I told them I'm not going to hurry back. Hi, Steve. <laughs> Morning. I had a dream about you last night, Stephen. Oh, okay. I'm not sure I want to hear this, but I, I, it was it was pretty amazing. You were uh, <laughs> you put together a team from West Newton meeting to play basketball in a preseason match with the Pacers, <laughs> <laughs> and you you were in your prime uh, <laughs> as a forward in this uh, dream. I don't know any idea where that came from, but uh, you would only put me in to be a designated fowler. 
because uh, <laughs> I was so bad. And so you would put me in only for that because I couldn't score a lick. But that's how I played in college, too. The coach always put me in when he needed somebody to get fouled and he didn't want to waste fouls on his valuable players. <laughs> but you were you were playing quite well last night. <laughs> well, that's good to know. <laughs> yeah, that's good. How's your harvest coming, Steve? Uh, coming well. We should finish soybeans this week. Uh, the best uh, overall average we've ever had on beans, which is nice. Wow. wow. Maybe I can retire and start playing basketball full time. <laughs> <laughs> Pacers better look out. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Hmm. I don't know if that dream meant anything about Steve's ability or the lack of ability on the Pacers upcoming season. <laughs> <laughs> I'm concerned that it has something to do with your message this morning. Maybe it's an omen about what are the messages going to be oh. on the sidelines waiting for a foul. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm going to offend people, foul them. <laughs> yes, I'm going to talk about sin and name names. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> no, I meant about people in the room. That's okay. We're on Zoom. <laughs> uh, Sylvia, Sylvia, did you get my text this morning about the cemetery and the columbarium? Oh, no. I haven't even looked at the phone. Well, you might uh -huh. want to do that. i uh, been talking to Steve Miller, and he's looked, I've looked, and we're going to look together. I'm not sure there's room enough in the old cemetery for a columbarium. Mm. And there are several unmarked graves that we're a little hesitant to start digging. Oh. Uh, he said we need to go down about three feet for a base for the columbarium. Yeah. So we may need to reconsider that particular thing and maybe move to the new cemetery. He and I are going to get together again this week and, and look in the old cemetery. Well, what would be the um, process for getting it in the new cemetery? Who Do we have any authority with that? <clears throat> oh, we know the person that's head of the board very well. Uh, Steve's sister, Jane, is actually also on the board. So oh. I think we would just talk to them and buy a plot big enough to put the columbarium. Okay. So. Oh, that's that's a good idea. Yeah. I like the old cemetery better personally. Just if if there's room, if there's not. I I agree. I agree. But there are over four hundred people buried on the top of that hill, and there are not nearly that many marker stones. So we're just afraid we might get into. A not good situation might dig up some of our relatives when they really didn't want to be dug up. <laughs> you might be in a nasty mood, you're thinking. <laughs> well, just a little bit more information if we have time for that. I've been looking for um, a source for some more plaques. Uh, I don't remember where those came from. I thought we bought four tiles. And, um, and Dale had them sawed apart. So that's not going well. I'm shopping for similar stuff like that. But um, the recommendation I got was contact um, people who make monuments and who engrave plaques already and have them done that way. So um, he said the cemetery people all do that. So if we would go to... Um, one of those places around the Indianapolis area, we'd have, we could, we could um, keep doing that and have somebody that has some consistent know-how and supply and, um, and continue what we're doing. Um, and we had small plaques made for mom and dad and Bonnie, the dog, 
and Chris's path that he made through the woods. I ordered them online. There was a place, uh -huh. little bronze, little bronze plaques about like this. And they've held up well. They were less than $100. Uh -huh. I mean, they were way less. They were like 50 or something. So, what size are they? Oh, about 18 inches by maybe six or eight. 18 inches? Oh. Well, maybe a foot. I'd have to look again. Okay. They're just the little ones. They're surrounded in uh, bronze and black paint. I don't think necessarily we need to make them match. Um, if we put them on a new wall uh, in random positions, or I don't, I don't know how we'd rearrange things if we had it the way we want to. We, we've kind of put them on according to when they're needed, but. Um, so not sure exactly what, what we would want, but if we could get them, these are black granite stone with that are engraved. I and, like the um, idea of, of copying what we have started already so that there's yeah. no break in the continuity. Yeah, I, I think it'd be nice to make them as similar as we can. Mm -hmm. If we can get yeah, them uh, available. And so maybe that's something we can do on when we get there is go visit a couple of right. places that do that sort of thing. I know Beth Prosser has two plaques for her parents that have not been engraved yet. And it's possible there are two additional ones uh, that are floating around either we have or, or uh, she has. And then I thought Clark Hadley was, all, wasn't he involved? Uh, Clark in Hadley's that process? friend. Brian, a teacher friend, Brian, has voluntarily engraved those for us. So we've not paid anything mm -hmm. for, for having that done. Right. But, um, they're not close like they are, like they were, and probably that source isn't going to be available forever. So okay. it makes sense to me that we find a, a source that's more mm -hmm. solidly dependable, even if we pay for them, because we have we have money. People have donated money to do that. So. I offered, I emailed him and asked him uh, if I could pay him and how much and all that sort of thing. And if he didn't like that, how about a charity of his choice um, to let me know? And I haven't heard a peep from him. Oh, well, well Lynn is, uh, it, it is time to start centering. So Lynn's got a uh, opening song for us to center to. Are there announcements to be made? Monthly meetings at 10.35. We have a rather full agenda again. Um, women's group is Wednesday at 10 o'clock at Norman's house.
How about that? How about joys and concerns? Well, I know uh, some of you know Susan Kellum. I don't know all, I don't know the details, but she's in the hospital. Mm -hmm. My brother oh, Bert's. Uh, go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. My brother Bert's granddaughter, Lance's daughter, Olivia, was in a bad accident last week and has several broken broken ribs and a broken leg and um, maybe a, a crushed pelvic um, vertebrae, and um, has been in the hospital and probably by now is in rehab. But we think she'll survive this, but it's going to be a, a rough recovery. Uh, which hospital is Susan in? Is she reachable? I don't know any details, but I can find out. So if Tim finds out, I'll put it in an email to us all. Thank you. We had the joy of ha having two of my sisters visit, two of the three. Uh, uh, I have three younger sisters. Our grandson, great grandson Colton, just found out his mom's going to have another little girl. So he's going to be the oldest brother of three little sisters. I just looked at him and go, Your life, as you know it, is over. <laughs> <laughs> he's only five, so he didn't get it. But, uh, <laughs> but we did have a real nice visit with uh, the two youngest ones. Uh, Julie was going back to Colorado on the train. She doesn't fly. So um, we only get to see her about once a year. So it was good to see her. It was okay to see Linda too, but we see her all the time. I love the worship leaders. So let's hold these uh, joys and concerns in our hearts and minds as we center further. And I will speak out the silence is, is led. Oh God, our help in all the ages. We give you thanks that we can be together this day for worship and fellowship. We each carry within us many joys and at the same time, many concerns, some of which we can speak of and some which we just need to hold tight in our hearts and share with you and share with each other silently and trust that our friends will support us and you will lead and guide us. We're thankful for the spiritual space to gather, to become a gathered meeting to share with one another and rejoice in our life together and praise your name together. Amen. For a scripture reading, I'm going to share from uh, Genesis. 
This is from the 12th chapter. And the Lord said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make unto you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through, through you. So Abram left, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Now Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran, and he took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram traveled throughout the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem. At the time the Canaanites were in the land, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to your offspring, I'll give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. And from there he went on toward the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. There he built a temple, an altar to the Lord. And he called on the name of the Lord. And then he set out and continued toward the Negev. I've been thinking a lot about uh, our congregation, of course, the, as we all have the past uh, number of years, and especially in the, the past few months. Um, and here we are on the moon, which uh, is both terrifying and I think uh, a wee bit exciting if we want to accept it that way. If you read scripture, I mean, it is full of uh, people that the Lord says, okay, go, go here, and they pack up and go. And by uh, doing so, they're faithful, and a whole new sort of life unfolds for them. Um, when I was looking at, that, that, at passages for uh, spiritual journeys, uh, like Abrams and others, uh, there was one commentator who said, well, you know, uh, maybe it didn't happen the way it planned, but, you know, actually the first spiritual pilgrimage was out of Eden. <laughs> when Adam and Eve got pitched from Eden into a whole new land, but still tried to follow the Lord. But the Abram story kind of resonated with me as I was thinking about um, our meeting and our adventure that's ahead of us. So Abram left and Abram was 75 years old. Well, we as a meeting are older than that, but yeah, he was no kid. He had all this baggage. He had history in the land where he was, um, but he packed up and I love the line, he, he just, uh, and all the possessions they had accumulated <laughs> and the people they'd acquired. Well, we are choosing which possessions we're going to take. And we're taking all the people that we've acquired. And that we will always be taking all the people that we've acquired over the years, no matter which buildings they worship in. The old log meeting house. The one down the road, this one, wherever we go. Um, those of you who are on Facebook have probably seen you. Know, I posted the announcement about the upcoming celebration, and you know, people do all these emoji cons anymore. And there more, were more than a few sad ones, you know. And I thought, well, it would be sad if we were just shut, shuttering the doors and closing. And we could still have celebrated a, a great life together, but we're not closing. We're, we're continuing on the journey. And I started thinking about it as, uh, as Abram. If you look what he does, he builds altars everywhere he's encountered God. He could return to those in some ways as, uh, and visit them and remember what happened there. I know occasionally when I go back to Columbus, 
Um, I will drive down Highland Avenue, which was the scene for many years of Highland Avenue Friends Church, church I was born into and uh, was there till I was 10 years old. Uh, and then I'll go around the corner and back out to Sullivan Avenue and out west to the new church, Westgate Friends Church, which where I spent my preteen and teen years and early young adult years. It's no longer Friends Church, but they're touchstones of faith. Uh, sometimes uh, I've meandered on my Indiana to Ohio trips up through Muncie just to look at Friends Memorial or over to Winchester to look at Jericho meeting. When I was thinking about pilgrimage, I was thinking about uh, a story I read years ago where someone was asking, well, what's the difference between a, a pilgrim and a tourist? And the answer was, well, a tourist basically goes, takes lots of pictures, comes home, and shows all the pictures to people and then keeps looking at the pictures over the years. But the journey's over. <laughs> I remembered how my folks, when I, uh, I was an early teen and my sisters were, of course, much, much younger, uh, my folks, and I don't know how they afforded it, but they took a trip to Hawaii. And it didn't matter who came over we always had to break out the Hawaii pictures. You know, it got to be a joke. Well, here we go. You know, somebody new is coming. Here come the photos. It's where they had been. And uh, and actually, they came up the other day because Linda put all the old home movies on DVDs now. And my sisters and I sat around and watched them for about four hours. But a pilgrim doesn't do that. A pilgrim leaves an altar and moves on because the journey continues. The journey is not over. It's, it's a constant moving. And it has a spiritual intent. Tourism may or may not, but it's not really seen that way. It's like, well, we, we check that off our list that we've been there, done that. But a pilgrimage, you really can't kind of do that. Even the the planned ones like uh, Katie Terrell went on the Camino de Santiago. I've had other friends who went on it too, you know, which is a planned pilgrimage that has a beginning and an end, but it has an intent. It has a destination that is to take you deeper spiritually so that you can keep moving through your life. And I guess I see uh, our life together is always having been a pilgrimage. Just like Abram. That we need to listen deeply and carefully to the voice of God. Now, I don't think uh, and maybe I'll be wrong, that, he, that God is going to make, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I believe that I will bless you part. I don't think we're going to be a great nation. I also don't think that like George Fox's vision from Pendle Hill, we're probably going to gather a great number of people unto us. Although I think we will gather a great number of spiritual pilgrims over the years unto us. But this building will survive as one of our altars of us together. This is a cemetery down the road marks a certain passage of our life together. And wherever we go next will be and after that. 
One of my friends who visited here a few times and was considering he and his young family at the time coming, a fellow named Mike Hollis. You may not remember them at all. They only came a couple of weeks, he and his wife, and they were Earlham grads and they had a little girl. But he was one of the people who responded <clears throat> to the announcement. He said, uh, so, so what are you doing next? And what's happening to the building? And so I explained to him how a new congregation would be moving in here. And he replied back, he goes, the only reason I'm asking is I always like to know what's happened with the places that have been our spiritual home, even if just for a few weeks. And it made me feel good that they were here a few weeks and they felt like it was a spiritual home of theirs and they still remember it. And so where, where, where are we going? Our monuments, our touchstones. Of course, touchstones and monuments, altars, meant a lot more in some ways to the Old Testament people and the people of Jesus' time than they, they do to us. But they're powerful if we think about it. Now, my sister, Julie, who's going back to Colorado, she and her equally crazy husband, Dave, they live on the side of a mountain. Well, they live on a cliff, <laughs> actually. They live on Log, Log Hill Mesa um, and uh, above the town of Ridgeway. And if you walk out their backyard, about 20 feet, uh, if you walk 21 feet, you will find yourself in the city of Ridgeway, uh, 1,000 feet below. <laughs> it is sheer rock face. It's Indian land, of course, Native American. The Ute tribe uh, lived there. They were very conscious of the land and they often made markers. You know, little rock piles like Abram did. And that's what my brother-in-law Dave does now. He gathers native rocks and he builds all kinds of monuments up and down the road, out by the cliff. And it's just a spiritual exercise for him. He's not what I would call religious. He is spiritual. But to see his handiwork is amazing. He built one while Julie was in Ohio these past two weeks, it's arched that he can walk under. But he says when he looks out there, they connect him, they ground him. And so this place will always ground us. The places where our spiritual lives have been, Mount Olive for Norma, my friend's churches where I grew up, Center Friends Will for Nancy. That was her place. So let's honor those places, but remember, we're not tourists. Oh, Nancy said, and Chip went there too. So <laughs> <laughs> but he but those are all touchstones for us. And may we always rejoice in those, remembering though that we are on pilgrimage. And one of the things I'm most pleased about at this time in our lives that we have listened to the call of God to move forward in new ways, to see what unfolds for us and to go together. May God continue to bless our journey. And may we continue to be faithful.
Thanks, Lynn. We'll now continue our unprogrammed worship. We'll bid goodbye to friends who need to leave and hope to see you at a monthly meeting if possible. Thank you for your enlightening message this morning, Brent. Thanks, Dave.
if all hearts are clear, we can close this period of meeting for worship and prepare for meeting for worship with attention to business. Do friends approve? Thank you for your words, Brent. Yes, very, thank you. Very thoughtful and helpful. Thank you, Brent. Good to see you, Jonathan. You too. Jonathan, glad you got the hymn book. Yeah, thanks again for sending them. You're quite welcome. Well, let's adjourn and we'll meet again in about 15 minutes or so. Bye. Bye.